Great. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about the Redfield Horde. You can see this wonderful array of coins in front of me. There's a really fascinating story behind this, and Mike's here to help us tell that story uh, about the Morgan, uh, the Morgan Silver Dollars and the Redfield Horde and how special it is. Hi, I'm Brett Elliott, and I'm sitting here with Mike Garofalo. Mike? Hi, Brett. Uh, I'm Mike Garofalo. I've been a coin dealer for uh, more than 40 years, a dozen of those years I spent here at Amex. Now, to kind of set this up a little bit, LaVere Redfield was a, uh, a bit of an interesting character. He was a gambler, uh, a little bit of a scoundrel. He was uh, a little bit of a recluse, uh, and he had his good qualities as well. And so this was a man who, in the 1920s, all the way through the Great Depression, was involved in stock market, was involved in real estate, and he was very successful, right? You know, he, he amassed a large fortune and uh, in, in an attempt to live the dream, retired at what we would consider to be a young age and moved out to Nevada uh, where he could avoid taxes as much as possible. <laughs> And he did that for a number of years. Uh, it really kept a low profile, maybe you know, ten to twelve years, uh, and then things started taking a turn. And a really kind of a tragic series of events happened, uh, which led to the creation of this massive silver dollar hoard. And he kind of became the silver, the the Morgan silver dollar baron, if you will. Uh, so we're going to get into a little bit of the history there, and uh, Mike, I'll let you take it from here. Tell us a little bit about, about LaVere Redfield. Well, one of the um, things, Brett, that, that happened to him was um, he, as you mentioned, liked to gamble. And one of the things that happened was he uh, won some money, about $2,300, uh, playing roulette uh, in um, Las Vegas or in Reno. And he won that money and he left the casino. And as he typically would do, he went to walk home. And unbeknownst to him, uh, someone was following him who had seen him win the money. And he was carrying the money in a paper bag. Well, when they got to a deserted area, the person approached him and said, I want your money. I have a gun and I'm going to take it from you. And um, Redfield, you know, fought him um, and what ultimately happened was the uh, the attacker picked up a brick and struck him 10, 12, maybe as many as 15 times uh, in the head with this brick. And even as he is lying there on the sidewalk bleeding, he wouldn't let go of the money. And no. finally, the, the attacker got scared off and left. Um, and at the hospital... While he was there and they're trying to treat him, he still wouldn't give up the money. Clutching it tight, you know. <laughs> he, 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 remember, he was somebody who came from nothing. Right. You know, he had no money. They were poor growing up and there were seven um, uh, kids. And the uh, he was brought up by, actually by, um, you know, a single mother. So, you know, he, he did leave a, a, a lead in a tough early life. Um, and his uh, penchant for money and his love of it really, really showed. He was robbed a couple of uh, additional times, one time in the 40s, where it was estimated to uh, be a two and a half million dollar robbery in um, cash and stocks, uh, in other securities, jewelry, etc. cetera. And um, that was the largest um, home robbery um, of the day. In fact, even the FBI was involved in mm -hmm. it. Um, and uh, it was made newspapers everywhere. But, you, you know, you mentioned uh, Redfield being a recluse. Um, he would pay uh, editors of newspapers to have their reporters not take his photograph. He didn't want people to, to know who he was. He, did, he dressed like a common um, laborer would, wearing jeans and old work shirts. He had uh, cars, and he would never use them. He walked everywhere. Basically, he wanted you to see him on the street and not pay any attention to him. That's how he felt comfortable uh, with his life. And uh, that uh, uh, second time that he got robbed, the two and a half million dollars, actually, um, as it turned out, he wound up going 
uh, getting in trouble with the law because of it, because he was subpoenaed to appear, and he and didn't, didn't want show. he didn't yeah. show up. He didn't want to go to court. He didn't want to be identified in court, and he didn't want people to know who he was and what he looked like. And really, a lot of the uh, you know these sort of tragic events that occurred. I mean, it it really it really is fascinating. I mean, it, it was kind of a classic rags to riches story at first, and life's going well. Tires early to Nevada has fun gambling for 10 years, and then all of a sudden, people start figuring out this guy has money, and he loses his anonymity uh, due to these high-profile cases. FBI is involved. Largest heist in U.S. history at the time. I think you had said 2.5 million back then is like 50 million today. Right. So huge amount of money <laughs> lost. And that wasn't the only time either, right? You know, he was he was robbed as much as, I think, four or five times, reportedly. Um and, and some of the myths around the events of some of these things are people tossing stakes to his guard dogs to get past and get into his home. Uh, but things really escalated, right? Right. Well, they, they did. And in fact, in that $2.5 million robbery, when the FBI was investigating it, one of the things they discovered was that he had about um, 270000 silver dollars that he had acquired in Vegas both through casinos and at banks, uh, and he had hidden them in his house. He had built these fake walls in his basement, and the FBI discovered it, and they made him take the money and deposit it in the banks. And that was something that he didn't want to do. He didn't want the government knowing what he had. Um, he didn't uh, trust the government, and he certainly didn't trust the banks, because part of, the, of, the, of his fortune uh, he made as the banks during the Depression were holding these uh, properties that were going up for foreclosure because people couldn't pay the taxes on it. That's and right. he bought a lot of those properties, and it helped him amass his fortune. But he never wanted to be in that position. And, and reportedly, uh, around the time that he got mugged, his, his wife had said that, I believe her name, her name was Nell, said that his hoarding tendencies became much worse. And eventually it got to the point where he got in trouble with the law again and was brought forward on tax evasion charges, right? right? Yeah, it was about um, between 1953 and 1956, he had underreported, uh, if you will, about $1.1 million. Now, you know, think of that, you know, underreporting that amount of money in the, in the 1950s. You know, you'd really have to be fabulously wealthy today to be able to, to do that. But um, he was sentenced to prison. Um, he served, I think, out of a five-year term, uh, only two years. And they let him go because he had a heart condition. And his wife w w was sick as well, too. So he didn't um, stay very long in prison. But um, after he died in 1974, his heirs who were his wife and his uh, niece, went through the house knowing his inclination to um, hide things. Mm -hmm. And they found a total of 407,000 silver dollars, primarily all Morgan dollars, uh, a few peace dollars as well. Um, and now it was a matter of what do we do with this? You know, four hundred and seven thousand dollars is you know is quite a lot of coins, you know, at face value. So um, at the time, silver was worth more than uh, the face value of the coins. Um, the uh, U.S. government had stopped uh, putting silver in our quarters, mm -hmm. um, half dollars, and dimes. Uh, in uh, 1964 was the last year. Right, so, so the heirs put it up for auction, right? Right, so they put it up for auction, and um, a uh, gentleman who was a Hollywood film producer but also had a, a, an, an interest in coins and had a financial services uh, company, Steve Markoff, actually bought it. He paid $7.3 million for the uh, 407000 Coins, so it, it turned out that he spent about uh, just under eighteen dollars per coin uh, to buy the entire lot. Now that was all well and good, except Markov knew he bought something great here, but he didn't have the marketing resources. 
So he turned to a, um, a big and important coin company of the day, and that was Paramount International Coin Company in California. They were one of the largest marketers at, at that time. And um, they got the coins, uh, broke them down by grades. Uh, they only had three grades that they used. They had uh, MS-60, which, which were the coins that were close to uncirculated and lower grade uncirculated coins, up to today's probably mint state 62 or 3 grade. Then he had the 65s, um, and the 65s, um, those were coins that were probably 63s to 66 using today's uh, grading standard and terminology. So the, the 60s were uh, in a black holder, the 65s were in red holders, and just a, you know, a, a small amount, maybe a, a couple of hundred coins were sealed in these dark green holders, mm -hmm. and those were just graded MS65+. plus. Those are extremely rare. They are. Yeah. So this is a great segue uh, to talk a little bit more about these and how you can buy and sell them with Atmex. We do buy them, we do sell them. These are the three we have in stock today, uh, but you know, inventory is always cycling out. Now, if you do go to buy these um, on your own, maybe through coin dealer or secondary market, there is something you have to watch out for, isn't there? Right, well there is, and um, back in the 70s, um, the late 70s, when I bought my first lots of these, we didn't have an internet to educate us, so um, you learned by talking to people. And one of the things that I learned was that when you look at the holder, uh, the holder says a silver dollar from the Redfield Collection, Mint State 65, Paramount International Coin Corp. Make sure if you're buying these in the secondary market that it says from the Redfield Collection because Paramount did so well in selling these coins to collectors and to other dealers. They were running out of them. Even though they had 407,000 coins to deal with, they were running out of them. So what they did was they started putting some of their own Morgan and Peace dollars from their inventory in holders that were exactly the same, with the exception that on the insert, it did not say from the Redfield Collection. So if it doesn't say from the Redfield Collection, don't buy it thinking that that's what you're owning a piece of. You're owning just a coin that was in Paramount's own inventory. But right. uh, they're, they're very collectible today. Um, of the 407,000, more than half probably are no longer in holders. You know, it was popular at the time when these first came out that, well, these holders are big. I really don't want to carry coins around a few hundred of those in my inventory. So dealers would just crack, crack them, them up, open. crack yeah. them out, take the coin out, and they might write on the, on the holder for a Redfield dollar or something. Uh, and then there are some of the holders today that haven't survived as well. Mm -hmm. And when they're sent to um, like one of the, the major grading services, either PCGS or NGC, when they're sent to those grading services, they will take them out of the holder if you want them to, mm -hmm. but they will attribute it. They'll, get, they'll put the line on the insert in their holder that says from the Redfield collection. So they keep the provenance of the coin together, and you'll always know while it's in that holder that it's part of the collection. It's just not in these original holders. Perfect. Well, thank you. So I think that's all we have for you today, ladies and gentlemen. If you do want to own a piece of history, come visit us at atmex.com. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, share with a friend. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.